the saying goes, the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice. But is their thirst for our blood really that deep? We've been antagonized from the start of dawn. We are the devil, the villains, the rapists, the uncivilized, the animals, the subhuman, the Negro. Lied to and cheated on from the start of time, our history erased, our culture stolen. We are left empty and exhausted, ashamed and broken. If only your features weren't so prominent. If only your name was easier to say and wasn't Kwame or Adebowale. If only you tamed your hair, made your hair like ours. If only you just got over what happened in the past. The same phrases used a hundred years ago are still used today but they are always so quick to say racism today is not as bad as it was during slavery racism is a thing of the past they adjudicate but how can you have the blindness to utter these words to a man who fears that the wrong stare could be critical how can you have the callowness to utter these words to a woman whose own hair is criminal how can you have the ignorance to utter these words to a people who see injustice just because of the color of their skin? Racism is alive today as he was yesterday and the day before and a thousand years ago, but he hides under a much more sinister mask. Stronger than before, taking lives in the night whilst people sleep comfortably in their false pretenses and privileges. Choosing to ignore the cries and agony of a mother who lost her 26-year-old daughter who dreamt of becoming a nurse, buying a house and starting a family, choosing to ignore the cries of a father who drew his last breath under the knee of the same police meant to protect him. He said, I can't breathe until he couldn't. If the same atrocities were suffocating your community, would you not turn your heads to help? Or would you still turn away? except your efforts are in vain. We can see racism all around us, claiming the lives of many. He is the devil, the villain, the uncivilized, the animal, the subhuman, not the Negro. For as the saying goes, the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. Honestly, getting through that video, I just have to say it was the hardest thing. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> but yeah, we'd like to thank you so much for playing that video, Fix. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce a very important young man today. His name is Benny Guama. I actually got your name right. Woo! Um, and we're here today to be able to talk to Benny. Benny, before we start, um, I'd just like to read your bio. Why not show a bit of what you've done, your accolades. Um, Benny is the founder of Weka, a digital leading and credit analysis platform for small businesses in Africa. Not only has he proven to be a leader and entrepreneur with his financial experience at Barclays Investment Bank and Operations Associate at Uber, he is a multi-award winning entrepreneur. Benny has featured amongst the top 10 best black students in the UK. Are you guys hearing top 10? Cool. As well as a winner in the Silicon Valley immersion sorry, program, Congolese born. Uh, Benny continues to be passionate about diaspora development program in Africa, as well as the role of distributed technology in combating poverty. Somebody needs to run me my check for reading that clearly. Well, <laughs> so Benny, how are you so far? I'm good. I'm good. I think I'm, I'm uh, slowly kind of getting that Friday feeling. Um, <laughs> but no, I'm good. Good, good, good. Um, so before we start, I thought instead of talking about Weka, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. um, kind of talk about a fun fact about you. Kind of get, um, you know, something either despite the professional. So tell us a fun fact about you. Well, this, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, don't know if this is, this is fun, but it's, it's strange. So basically, you know, when you're born, Everyone comes out head first, okay. uh, but I was different. I came out leg first. Oh, so, wow! So yeah, they kind of had to like break up my leg to make sure I came out properly. So I mean, I wouldn't want you guys to imagine that, but that's that's how I came out. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's cool. <laughs> Everyone in the comments is probably thinking, "Raw leg." <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's a very interesting fact, to be honest. Um, thank you. But, yeah, thank let's you. Talk about Weka. Um, uh -huh. What really made you create Weka? What was the inspiration behind it? You know, what made you want to 
develop this particular program? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, like the bio says, I was born in Congo. Uh, so when I was in Congo, my mum came to the UK before before I did, and she'll send money back for school uh, to eat and etc. And then I came a year later after her. Um, so studied, went to uni, then started working at Barclays, and it was kind of my turn to kind of take it up and send money back to aunties and uncles back home. And I think you know, there was one time where I was kind of in the queue for Western Union. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, in the space of 20 years. Uh, so I came to the UK when I was about um, seven. So yeah, about 18 years have passed. Um, and yeah, nothing much had changed in terms of there was still this dependency cycle where mm -hmm. those back home were kind of expecting like a paycheck or some sort of funds being distributed back um, back home. Um, and my thinking was, you know, can we go further? Um, yeah. Can we, can we actually um, use our economic power that we have to actually do more on the continent? Because remittance, which was sending money, is used up and then come back again. So my thinking was, can we actually go much further and actually invest in businesses that are doing amazing work so that those on the ground can actually you know, help themselves but also profit from this amazing digital innovation happening in the continent? And that's how, um, yeah, that's how it started. Um, yeah, that was kind of that rationale behind it. Yeah, no, that sounds really, really cool. I think just to add, um, ask on the back of that, like mm -hmm. how has um, the progress been so far? Like how many people have we reached? You know, how far are we going? And kind of what's the vision for Weka later down the line? Yeah, sure thing. So yeah, we've launched, we've done a soft launch. So we've got a product that's working. We've had uh, our first initial investors, our first businesses. So how Weka is structured is we're based both in London and in Accra, Ghana. So my co-founder is based That's in Accra. <laughs> I knew you were going to say something. <laughs> I knew you were going to say something. <laughs> I mean, Ghana's booming. So um, yeah, so we're kind of starting operations in Ghana. Uh, and what we do is, because we're still early stage, we work with um, partners on the ground. Yeah. So we work with accelerators and banks to get with the pipeline of businesses that we can invest in. And then over here in the UK, we've got a platform that centralizes all the investment opportunities. It gives you a background in the businesses, what they do, uh, what the investment's about, and also a chance for you to track your investments. Um, yeah, and then all you do is you choose who you invest in. Uh, so a company that matches your risk appetite, that matches the geography that you want to invest in, that matches your impact size. Yeah, and you choose to invest in it, and you get a return uh, once the, the company you know, makes, makes the revenue. Um, yeah, so that's how it's structured. Uh, in terms of progress, so we're kind of partnered um, and we're supported by Cambridge University. So we went for a program with them. Uh, we worked for a company called Clifford Chance. They handle uh, our regulate, regulatory stuff. So because we're a financial company, we need to get FCA regulated. So they work with us to get our regulation on that side. Um, we also partner with Google, Google for Startups. So our office space is out of Google in uh, Shoreditch and they help us with just kind of growing. So kind of tech expertise as well as office space. Um, and yeah, so we've done our first round of investments. So now we're looking to grow um, to the next round, which is the Weka 200. Uh, so the next 200 investors. Uh, the hope is we're creating a community of investors, you know, people like yourselves, young professionals, um, and communities called Wakanda, uh, playing on with you know Black Panther. Uh, so yeah, we're going from like a 100, 200, to eventually Weka 1000, yeah. and by then we should have our license to essentially launch Weka to to anyone. We're targeting the diaspora initially, but eventually we want to reach anyone and everyone yeah. who is passionate about investing in great companies on the continent. Um, the wider vision is we really want to make investing in businesses in Africa less risky. Mm. So what we're doing is we're employing technology whereby we uh, make use of the data that the business, businesses have. Because back in the day, most businesses in Africa were not digital. Most mm. of them were like farms or were shops. But nowadays, you've got a lot of businesses that are platforms, they are e-commerce. Um, so it means they have access to data that wasn't readily available 10 years ago. So what we do, or what we're doing, is we're building a model that uses that data 
to more accurately capture the risk of the businesses, therefore making your investment you know, a lot more secure um, than it would have been a while ago, 10 years ago. Now, that sounds really innovative. To be honest. And for thank anyone you, that's thank you. interested in investment or just general entrepreneurship, like, Make sure you follow him on LinkedIn. Um, I've done so myself. I'm not nice, going to Nice, um, nice, nice. <laughs> no, no, you guys definitely, you know, re reach out to me. Um, you know, I remember kind of being a student at York. Yeah. Uh, you're kind of desperate to get grad jobs for one. Um, and also, yeah, just kind of figuring out what you want to do. Um, and I was going to talk about that, actually. Yeah. You know, York alumni. Like, what was the most challenging thing about being a black student in York specifically, actually, for you? Um... To be fair, so I knew, like, I wanted to kind of take myself out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Um, okay. And I knew for a fact I wanted to leave London. Mm. Um, and when I came to your open day, I was like, wow. I said, like, you know, this is, uh, this is what I'm playing with, yeah. Um, but actually, I became more determined to actually show you, you know, what black excellence can look like. Uh, yeah. Because one, I want to make you one, I look like me, but I wanted to kind of set a bar as to what people like us can do and we're actually you know um talented and essentially yeah just show them what black excellence looks like so my thinking was i came into your very determined to prove myself um in terms of challenges um yeah i mean challenges that you would face being an outsider you, know, you get silly questions um you get people having presumptions about your ability presumptions about what you can and can't do um but i kind of put that to one side um and i think i was able to carry myself with confidence um and yeah i kind of went all in so i did a bunch of societies uh started a few ventures um yeah and just was keen to not allow the fact that there weren't many black people in york be a hindrance or allow the fact that i started from home be an issue I yeah. kind of just, just embraced it, really. No, that's so true. And I think that's just a word of advice for anybody that's a fresher, anybody that's a second year or even third year, just jump into it fully and not um, allow your race to be one um, barrier from preventing you to go to where you need to go, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it, it rounds up our quick and impactful <laughs> conversation. <laughs> um, but if anybody wants to follow you, where do we follow you? Whereabouts do we um, find you specifically? Yeah, so as you said, Deborah, you can find me on LinkedIn uh, for kind of anything business related or yeah. career related. Uh, I'm, I'm super open. Uh, so I'm not the kind of person to say, oh, you know, entrepreneurship is amazing or investment banking is amazing. But I'll tell you how it is. Um, yeah. And also, I help you with getting the role. Uh, so, you know, please reach out. I don't promise I'll get back to you in like quick time. Um, but, you know, please reach out for LinkedIn. Uh, also, Instagram. Um, so, you can either add the company Weka, like can invest, or just yeah. like me. Um, and yeah, you can connect through there. But, yeah, please don't feel afraid to kind of reach out to me. We're well, happy to kind of chat. Okay, cool. Can everybody in the comments, can we say thank you to Penny for that lovely, lovely, impactful information? Just the way how you guys spammed the number ones and doing a Mazza. Can we do the same thing and say thank you? Uh, thank you. I'm screaming. <laughs> All right, lovely. Uh, up to you, Victor. And I'm going to change. Sick, man. Sick, sick, sick. Now, thank you, Benny, for that. That's really inspirational. I think that it's really good to see other people, especially from our background, investing. I think that's really important because and giving back to you know back home that's a whole different conversation but back home because there's so much especially in gh there's so much that can be built up and it's just a matter of us going back there and having the information and the inspiration to kind of go back there and build the infrastructure up so no nah, thank you for that that's really inspirational cool so now we're going to move on to our next section and um, benny while you're here i'm going to kind of keep you kind of in the loop about you know what's being said and kind of getting your opinion on what's being said yeah so we're going to go into our debate section so just to recap on the rules one person's going to talk at a time and the two members from each of our societies will have five minutes to present their arguments for the topic and we're not going to have anyone speaking over each other 
And after the arguments are presented, me and Deborah are gonna present a question. And also we're gonna have two questions from um, the audience. Two questions from the audience. So use that Q&A function, use that Q&A function to put in a question. If you have a question that's you know, for the debaters. Um, and then after, after the debate's wrapped up on the topic, we're gonna have a vote. We're gonna have a public vote on everyone that's in here um, to see who had the best argument. And um, for the topic. Cool. So the topic is surrounding the root cause of prejudice and injustice. So the question is, is ignorance the root cause of prejudice and injustice? And to kick off, we're going to have our first debater. We're going to have a first debater from the York Anti-Racist Society. Cool. So we're going to have APRA. She represents the York Anti Racist Society. She's a third year physician and she also does philosophy with that at the University of York. And she is the president of the recently ratified York Anti Racist Collective Society. And as a part of her role in the society, she's tried to get involved in other things on campus, including this event right here, to ensure that BAME students are heard throughout their degree. APRA, are you ready to present your arguments? Yeah. Thanks cool. for that introduction. Take the floor away. You've got five sure. minutes then. Sure. So is ignorance the root of cause of prejudice and injustice? And before I answer this question, I really want to make sure that we don't mix up prejudice and injustice as if it's one thing. It's connected, but it's not the same thing. If we look at prejudice, it's more linked to ignorance because there's this idea of passivity with it. So um, if you prejudge Black History Month, um, you might be like, oh, why do we have a whole month for this? Because you're being ignorant about it. And your ignorance has stemmed from the fact that around you, you're not really taught anything about black history. When you go to school, black history is basically taught really badly. Um, it's basically just the civil rights movement or slavery. Um, when you just look around you, media doesn't really perpetuate this idea that beyond these two things, um, we have a history. So through this, you become ignorant and then you start to prejudge things. So from that, I would say yes. But if we're going to look at injustice, I don't think it's um, as passive as being linked to ignorance. Injustice, in my opinion, is actually completely planned. When something that happens that is not just, somebody decided to do that. They really like went through it. It's, system it's, this, it's part of a system, like it's part of an institution. If we look back at black history, which is, you know, what this whole topic is about, um, it's an injustice that for many students watching this, myself included, I only really learned about black history when I came to university or when I did my own actual research. That's an injustice forced on us by the education system, by the world around us that is predominantly anti-black. That is something somebody planned so that they could perpetuate other things about the world around us. So to say that it's rooted in ignorance is letting people off. It's saying it's some passive thing rather than saying, no, somebody planned this. And this explains why it took me to get to 20 years old to realize that black people have been in Britain since like the Roman times, not since slavery. Um, so in conclusion, my answer is kind of yes and no. Um, ignorance can be the root of prejudice because it means that there's some things you have to unlearn and there's kind of this idea of redemption with it, but not injustice, because I think that lets people off that do things that actually are part of our institution, like racism. I don't know how long that was, but um, yeah. No, thank you for that. Thank you for that. No, we appreciate that answer. I think you had some good points in there. I think you had some good points in there. Yeah, um, you basically said that um, injustice, it's not just about ignorance, it's also about how our society was kind of designed from the ground up. I have one question though. Um, I don't know if Deborah, you have a question as well. But for me, you could, especially when I have debates with my white yeah. friends, they often talk about how, um, you know, it's not what we did that kind of incited, you know, the racism that we see in society today. It's what the people in the past did, our ancestors, it's what, um, you know, bad-minded slave owners did it's and even them they thought that was normal at the time it wasn't that they were bad people it's just what they thought was normal so they could easily claim that they are ignorant to you know the workings of the world around them and what happened in the past so what would you say to some of my white friends in that instance 
Um, I would simply say they're lying because um, they've actually acknowledged that, you know, slavery happened, that racism happened. Through that knowledge, um, they have actually become aware of the fact that they know that some of the privileges they have have come from before them. So then to deny that that's not true, um, I think it's kind of just not really taking any accountability, um, which is why I'm kind of wary when people say things like that, because if you do know that, you know, slavery happened a long time ago, and then you look at, for example, George Floyd, it's very hard for you not to make the connection, especially now when us as black people, even here in this webinar, are basically telling you all the time. Um, so yes, I hope that answered the question. No, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Yes, I, had a, I had the same question. I was gonna ask like, what would you say to people that say, well, technically it's not our fault, but Victor technically already answered that question. So um, yeah, I think, that was good unless you want unless we're getting a question now from the audience or not no after okay cool um so first of all let's give a round of applause a virtual round of applause for apra's apra yes i got it right oh i'm doing well with names today come on okay yeah um just give a round of applause for apra on the comments if you can do a virtual hand clap do something in the comments um but yeah so before we start we'd like to introduce team one, ACS gang, ACS on the block. It is what it is. Um, we'd like it's to introduce team gang. Anyway. I know, I know, but then again, I'm not a judge. Do you understand? But I can be biased here. Do you I, get? Hear that. I hear that um, too. <laughs> but anyway, we'd like to introduce team one, uh, Renee, to be able to introduce her specific argument. So yeah. Over to you. Sorry, when she said Renee, did she mean me? Oh, Ren, yeah, sorry. Okay, Ren, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's fine, I mean, yeah, yeah, in that way. Um, I do agree a lot with, wait, am I introducing myself or I'm going with the debate? Just go straight with the debate. Okay, so I do agree a lot with what Aqua said. Um, mostly ignorance. I think pre prejudice is more of a combination of two things. So I think it's, um, it's sort of ignorance and fear go hand in hand when it comes to prejudice. First, ignorance is obviously not knowing and then the fear at the same time to sort of fuel the hate that really stimulates prejudice and injustice, well, mostly injustice. And I really think that it has to do with not only history, but it's also um, society now. To give some context to myself, I, although um, York University, I do study social and political science with philosophy, but in my background, I'm also a film student. That's why I made you apply for. So it's not just um, looking things at even the social political aspects, it's even things down to um, simple media, um, cinema as well, how black people in general, even from slavery and moving on into our liberation and, you know, USA when there was Juneteenth, um, how we're portrayed in the media. So either way, you can jump from slavery happening. But even then, we still have this whole um, portrayal of us, whether it's Black men being beast or um, Black women either being Jezebels and almost being animalistic, even going down to things such as colorism, even going down to things such as in our simple media injustices against Black women. Um, so it, it really... <laughs> I think it's, yes, it's ignorance from the outside, but I also think it's, um, it can also go into our community as well, another layer to it. And I think it's also the lack of empathy that we have for other individuals in the black community, whether that's black trans lives, whether that's even black women and how much we have to constantly fight to tell our stories. So I think as much as we like to put it on such as like, um, you know, people in, in power society speaking, so white people, white straight men who are always carrying the narratives or being the ones to you know push forward certain narratives whether malevolent or benevolent we also have to look into our community as well and see the prejudice and saw the injustices that we allow to happen and our complacent attitudes that we also have so yeah. that was a good that was a good argument actually um it it's funny that you mentioned um black trans lives actually um because we're learning about it specifically in, I say, my degree. Um, so do, do you believe that people being taught an educational level about these specific topics is 
enough education or do you believe that um, the basic level of um, being taught about racism, being taught about um, prejudice is enough to be able to prevent ignorance? Like what level of education do you believe is, is an indicator for um, not being ignorant, if that made sense, if that question was made sense, yeah. Obviously it comes with um, education. It, you can look at the school education stimulus where we've been taught months and months and months about World War II, but even in World War II, you have such like the Tuskegee Air Force in the US, which was the all black Air Force that now has the HBCU named after them um, by Booker T. Washington. You have all of this that we're not told about. And then we have so much we learn about the Tudors. And then what one time you learn in um, English literature about Shakespeare, and then he incorporates um, Othello being a Moor. And then you have um, a merchant of Venice where one man was a Moor who had like a whole paragraph saying, even though our blood is both red, do not look at my skin and like, do not make my skin the main indicator of who I am. But at the same time, yes, education is very important, but I think it's also, it starts at home as well. And I think it's this idea that we need to, as Black people, we need to leave the house every day with our Black pride, with our, you know, knowing our history, because we can't sit there and believe that this education system is going to give us the accurate history. They're going to give us what they know. Even look at museums, look at films like Black Panther. He literally speaks about how museums, as much as they like to be like, oh, this is a spectacle of history you stole from us. So you can't literally take our, like, um, the, the, curriculum sorry and think that that's going to be a perfect indicator that okay yeah sure they can teach us and yes one or two white people may not know may no longer use the n-word but that's not necessarily teaching us our black history they're not going to tell us about the ashanti tribes and they're not going to tell us about the um the zulu tribes that they had many years ago they're not going to tell us about how even in the zulu tribes they were the first people to discover bulletproof um leather before that was even a thing in the 18th 19th 20th century like they're not going to tell us any of that that's something that you have to go out of your way where i come from i'm liberian and Ghanaian, but i mostly wrap the liberian flag where my country's history is literally us that the uh, u.s government telling us you can either stay in this country and let it improve or you can go back to africa and what we decided to do we went back to africa and we decided to improve things for ourselves and we sat we fought and yes there was some obviously a civil war and those things going on but we made it for ourselves. We are the first um, country in Africa to be a republic. We are the first country in Africa to have a female president. And that's something that a lot of people don't know. And I think it's even within like the African, the black diaspora, but the African diaspora, it is, is this constant division between us and this idea that, you know, the whole African-American experience, African experience, Caribbean experience is different. Yes. But the whole thing is we need to also come together. And I also think as leading to your, from your question, um, Deborah, is the curriculum can only teach you so much. That's what I'm saying. The curriculum is only there, like teachers at the end of the day, they want their paycheck. Mm. So they're gonna teach you tutors. They're gonna teach you World War II. They're gonna teach you um, medicine through time. They're gonna teach you American West. And yes, if they add black history, yeah, they might teach you that. Matter of fact, just a little anecdote. So I was in this year, um, eight classroom, I had to for um, sick form, community service and they were doing slavery and oh this teacher I feel so sorry for her. I don't think she meant in this way but I was the only black individual in the classroom not to mention that the history was incredibly inaccurate talking about um if the master liked you how slaves field slaves could become house slaves which is absolutely inaccurate they were raped and therefore they had mulattoes um, not to mention that she tried to make an example of me by stating if Ren were a slave in this time, um, she might have been a field slave. I, with my Afro, looking very Afrocentric that day, had to sort of just hold my tongue because I wasn't necessarily going to have a whole history lesson in front of a history roast down in front of a bunch of year eight students. However, it's the inaccuracy that they're taught. And I think a lot of the things that they do is just they try to pander to the children and depending on their age, because from a young age, they're not going to tell you from jump, yes, masters raped their slaves and had mixed race children and called them mulattoes and this, that and the other. But at the same time, you can't hide away from the actual historical accuracies, not to mention films have so many historical inaccuracies to make us feel better. Like the new Harriet Tubman film, there was a lot of inaccuracies there, but yeah. Cool. Cool. No, I hear all of that. I hear all of that. I want to bring Benny in before he goes. 
I want to bring him in just to get his opinion on the kind of two sides that we kind of heard so far. Benny, what did you think about some of the points that were raised just in general? Um, I think the points raised were great. Um, I think it wasn't, it wasn't so much a uh, debate where there's two opposing sides. I think there was you know, somewhat general agreement in terms of what the root causes of prejudice and justice was. Um, I think, um, is it APRA? I'm saying it correctly. Nice. Uh, so I think APRA's point about um, it's not so much ignorance, um, it's actually the, um, the purposeful like, realization that you know, we need to build a system or a structure to purposely um, um, bound a group of people is actually what I think is a major cause of injustice. Because you know, to build a system, there has to be strong intent behind it. Um, I think, like, and also to perpetuate that system uh, for thousands of years, there has to be enablers or key players who are intent on keeping the status quo. Um, so yeah, I guess I really agree with that cross point that you know, ignorance is you know is a factor that does play a part in prejudice. Um, because, for instance, you know, um, I wouldn't say individuals are born racist, um, but you know, if all their lives they've been told a certain a certain information, as uh, as Ren was saying, if they've been fed a particular um, a particular uh, narrative, then because they just simply don't know about the full story, their behaviours um, kind of uh, are in line with what they've been told. So in a sense, you know, they prejudge individuals or prejudge um, groups of people based on what they know. Um, sure. And due to the fact that they don't know the full story. But overall, in terms of like what the root causes, I think it's most definitely not ignorance. I think there is kind of um, a, a strong intent by individuals to you know, maintain the status quo of injustice. For sure, for sure. <laughs> We want to bring the audience in a little bit. So this is your opportunity to come in if you're watching. If you want to ask either side any questions in particular, either raise your hand or put a question in the Q&A button down below. This is your opportunity to kind of have a say in what's gone on and the points that have been made tonight. So if anyone has any points that they want to say, if anyone wishes they could have said anything, you, they should put it in right now so that they can get their voice heard and get their points across. Now, I do want to say one thing to both sides. We appreciate your views. And I think that just in general, like, like Benny said, actually, it's not a thing where it was, you know, prejudice and injustice doesn't really exist. It doesn't really exist at all. I think it's a case of um, differing views and how they are actually constructed from the ground up. And, um, you know, Ren, you talked a lot about the curriculum and how it's not, you know, and I agree with you in the sense of a national curriculum, which has to cater to absolutely everybody in the country, especially with the fact that we are a minority in this country. Um, there isn't, you could argue, especially if you looked at how the curriculum has been revised recently, there isn't an onus to teach, you know, the wealth of black history that is actually within the country. I don't know if you know, but back in the day, they used to do lots of, especially in the Caribbean community, they used to do a lot of Pan-African Saturday school. If you've listened to our Carla talk, you know, he's mentioned this like up teen times. And if you know any Jamaicans, they would have talked about it. They had their own separate curriculum that was separate from the national curriculum, but taught them about their own history and their own wealth and their own excellence in many aspects. But I do agree though that a lot of the ignorance that white people do claim is not rooted in a lot of, you know, fact because, because of the fact that they kind of say things, but they don't acknowledge other things or they kind of pick and choose where they really want to claim, you know, the past and how they want to acknowledge the present. So I do agree with you Apra, in that sense. We've got a few questions. Also with the questions, we're going to take, couple of questions just before seven so we can get the poll done but if you if anyone else adds a question say who it's towards yeah say who it's towards cool so an anonymous person has said if is black lives matter a force for good or is it a political tool for the left 
I want to go to APRA first. Um, I think saying it's a force for good is even like diminishing it. It's actually just a human rights issue. It's just saying that black people deserve to live. No, not even to live, to survive. And from that, we're saying, actually, we actually also want to thrive. I don't um, see how saying that you want people who have been historically oppressed based on something that was actually made up to justify that oppression. That is just a tool for the left when we're just saying you're not allowed to kill us anymore. Um, and not only that, that's not good enough. We actually want to completely navigate the world as ourselves. So, um, of course, it's a force for good, but I think it's actually a necessity in order for this racism in general to not continue at all because it can't, it's actually completely self-destructive. Um, so, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Ren? Um, I do agree with Apple on that one. I mean, Black Lives Matter literally is in the name Black Lives Matter. It's there to obviously, to fight against the injustices that we face every single day. I think the only way someone could consider it being a political tool of the left would be, you know, is just these woke, like um, right now, the political climate of the US, you have the, um, the, sorry, the political campaign that's going on against the Republicans, Democrats. I, the only way you can even consider Black Lives Matter being used is if the Democratic Party, which barely does anything for Black people, but has historically been known as the Black People Party that we vote for, to pander to Black people's vote by slabbing the Black Lives Matter logo, logo onto their um, campaign, their manifestos, what they believe in, their so-called legislation that they're going to put in to try and get our vote. However, whether or not we actually see change that is going to benefit us, that's another thing. But on the surface level, yes, it is a great thing. And I just love the fact that it's finally picking up the steam that it should have had since it began. But now it's a, a catalyst. And the main thing, one quote I saw on Twitter is how so many people have been so ignorant thinking that Black Lives Matter, these protests have just been for, um, George Floyd, but realistically speaking, it's been for so many more. Like it's been for Emmett Till, even yeah. for um. I'm so I, I hate the fact that I forgot her name, but um, the young black woman who actually was the main insider of the 1992, I think, LA riots. However, everyone thinks it was because of the Rodney King beating, but it was actually a micro, no, a microaggression, but a major event that happened way before in which she was killed in a convenience store. So it's not even just by the police, but it's been, a, been by so many different things leading up. And I think I'm just so proud to say that it's finally picked up steam that it has. And so many people are now actually, they can't run away from it. It's everywhere now. Cool, cool. We're gonna take one more question from the audience. And it's just about, it's from Harleen here. And it's about how we should approach the curriculum in the future. Um, and how to diversify it. How can we teach people about the history and ensure that they are fully educated about not only the issues on the surface, but the more deep rooted history that not many people know? We can go to Ren this time first. Hi. Um, how to, okay, the curriculum. Now first, okay, the number one thing I noticed was when we studied for, um, I think this was year nine, when we studied for um, World War II, we had so long to do, like two months on that same topic. We've been learning about it since year five. Like this country rants and raves about it, which is understandable. It's, it was one of the biggest events in human history. However, they constantly keep leaving out the part of all the black men and women who put their lives on the line. And then they usually just throw in like one or two individuals. But the main thing I feel is when it comes to civil rights, because civil rights we left in year nine was incredibly rushed. We didn't do a project, we didn't go and research, we didn't, we weren't meant to do that. All they did was slap on a movie, Selma, and they thought civil rights, we did a great job. I think first of all, slavery was incredibly rushed and they usually, okay, the main thing that irritates me is the fact that every time they talk about black history, they think it begins with slavery, where black history has begun way before that, centuries before that. You have the ancient Egyptians who were, as everyone knows, dark skinned, Nubian king and queens. So I don't know why they keep putting forward that they were lighter skinned or white or 
I don't know, Eurocentric in some way, shape or form. And then they think that slavery is where our existence came about, when we've been ex existing for so many years. Like I said, in English literature, we constantly bump into the Moors who were black people at the time and who were around and who had a whole empire. You have Mansa Musa, who was one of the richest men alive of the Mali empire, and they completely leave him out, but we constantly run and rave about Jeff Bevos, like he, like, wow. Okay, <laughs> so that's one. And two, we, first of all, we need to start black history originally where it is, because you constantly have scientists finding so many different bodies of like the first man, first woman, Lucy found in Ethiopia, you have the entire Ethiopian empire, and they totally leave that out. And then they only go to the west side and the west um, coast of Africa, Ghana and, you know, etc. <laughs> to talk about slavery as if we magically just appeared at the time where the U Europeans wanted slaves and our suffering is the only narrative that we know and I think in different ways we can educate because it's not even just in the classroom I think it's also when it comes to the arts as well and how we're portrayed in cinema and film I think I'm happier now that we have a lot of black directors who have more nuanced portrayals of being black and black history and what it means to be black in any time whether it's the 60s to 2020 but I still think we need more. And it's just to, to nip in the bud these little ignorant conversations of why white people can't say the N-word and always oh, okay for white people to wear um, locks, which aren't even meant to be called dreadlocks, but locks, even education yeah. like that, to just sort of prevent that ignorance, you know, yeah. Yeah, and no, I hear that. Let's bring Apri in really quickly because we do want to bring one more person in as well. Sure. Um, I'd say um, there's two main ways to do this. The first one is simply telling the truth and the second one is context. Um, so the first one is, as was mentioned, you know, black history is human history. Um, we all came from the continent of Africa. So if you are going to talk about history itself, you can't really ignore um, black history. So it wouldn't actually be very hard to incorporate it into the um, curriculum if we were just honest about human history um, as a whole yeah. and um, second of all context if sometimes we just get taught things that are not in our degrees like okay this just happened this philosophy this philosopher just thought this thing the scientist just you know start thinking about this thing and now we know this theory but there's no context you know we're not told what was happening at the time politically things like that and I think it's very similar for things like race um, and decolonizing the curriculum a really good example is um, science. Most people don't think we can decolonize it um, because it's seen as really objective. But if you look at the type of people who were doing the science, they were around when the slave trade was happening. So that was definitely influencing the way they thought. Um, you know, race science, which is actually still kind of being practiced today, you know, um, people used some things we know in biology now that we learn in GCSE. Those people also ha had really weird ideas about race. So I don't think decolonizing the curriculum is necessarily completely like throwing it away. It's just filling in the really important gaps so that things make sense. And that uh, we're taught why people came to this, to those educational conclusions because of what was happening at the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. I see Yola's got a point. She's raised her hand. Yola, over to you. Hi, um, I just want to say, first of all, uh, it's, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, APRA has spoken uh, about, uh, you know, uh, just getting into a little bit about philosophy, because um, my father is a physicist, and he's now a historian of science. And I think it's really great that um, we're, we're having this discussion about decolonize, decolonizing um the the curriculum and I think you know it's it's not it's 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 not something that completely as you said you know throws away um, the curriculum and I'm really happy that you've said that because you know what it is is that it's also acknowledging and I and I've been saying this to my professors as well it's acknowledging that you know the colonial project actually nurtures. Uh, uh, nurtures, you know, uh, uh, ideologies from racialized epistemologies of ignorance, really. And 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 when we use the word ignorance. We're not saying that you know it's you know it's people being dumb, but it's essentially what people miss and misunderstand. So, for an example, um, you know, one aspect of 
epistemological authority that's been thrown around and, 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 and misconstrued and also, you know, how ignorance plays out. For an example is, you know, when you look at uh, 1968, I mean, most people uh, unfortunately believe that um, Black people instantly became equal in America um, mm. yeah, after yeah. Uh, 1968. Like <laughs> and, and, and it's... Um, and, what, what we're trying to do is is say that actually there's a lot of information that you miss. We're not saying that, oh, this is wrong and this is right, but we're trying to have a lot more of uh, a whole uh, epistemology that's a lot more honest and open and true to what the facts are. So I'm, I'm really glad that you've uh, uh, spoken about this because um, what it really gets into is in examining the epistemologies of ignorance as a product of the structures and ideologies of whiteness, then that's when we start to see the constructions of erasure of narratives, you know, which, which hinder us from even understanding how people in South America viewed themselves and viewed their own art and artifacts. Which is exactly why, I mean, when we when we talk about, okay, people come in and they say, well, I believe in facts and science. And it's like, well, here's the thing. There's a whole philosophy on uh, uh, science. And what we're, what we're figuring out is that actually what one decides to, how one even decides to um, go about uh, uh, trying to verify things is is, is, is something that's up in the air. I mean, there's so many philosophies based on even the ideas of truth. Mm -hmm. So we do, I think, have to raise our, our hands whenever there's um, a confusion, because I think on, on just points of clarification. So if you do as a black person feel like, okay, um, this is not making a lot of sense. And I think that, you know, just, just, just raising those questions to your professors and tutors respectfully and saying, you know, on a point of clarification, I'd like to understand why this, 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 and this um, makes sense to this person and why this was said in this particular way. Because then what you're doing is that you're actually uh, engaging in a lot more intellectually rigorous engagement with your subject. And I don't think anyone should, should, should be angry about you having some uh, uh, intellectual rigor with regards to your own curriculum. And I think that those are the small ways that we can actually um, you know, have our own little silent protest is to constantly ask questions and mm. for, for clarification. Yeah. Mm. No, for sure, for sure. I hear that completely. I hear that completely. Okay, cool. So we're gonna go to a little bit of a poll now, and um, just to see as to which side was more convincing in this discussion. Now, even though both sides raised amazing points, and I think both sides will probably agree with the points that were raised on both sides. Um. We'd like you. There should be a poll on your screen right about now. Yeah, there should be a poll on your screen right about now as to which side held the more convincing arguments. Just going to give everyone a few more seconds to vote. So, which side? held the more convincing arguments. APRA with the York Anti-Racist Collective or Rennie with the Afro-Caribbean Society. I'm gonna give everyone 10 more seconds to vote. Okay, cool, okay, cool. I believe we're going to reveal the results of the poll at the end. Is that correct, Fix? Yeah? Okay, cool. So we're going to reveal the results of the poll at the end. But for now, we're going to go on to the next, we're going to go on to the final section of what we've got planned today. Now, we're going to introduce the panellists. Now, we're going to introduce the panellists and yeah, I've been excited for this part. I've been excited for this part. So the first panelist that we're going to introduce and give time to speak is Says Holmes Lewis. Now, <laughs> with this, 
how shall I even start? Okay, cool. The first time I heard him speak was around May, and he's even going to talk about this a little bit. Um, in fact, I won't even say what I heard him say. I won't even say that. I'll let him do that. But it, the first time I heard him speak, it was with a prom, for sure. It was with a prom, and I was like, okay, cool. I only saw the little snippet, but I, inst- I didn't even see the caption. But as someone who's from a certain background, I knew exactly what had happened. I saw the car in the background. I saw the vim which, which, with which he was speaking. I was like, okay, cool. I know what's happened here. Um, then about a month later, I saw him in a socially distanced room with the people he was talking to. And I was like, okay, this guy's serious. I respect him. I have some respect for this guy because of what he's doing in the community. Turns out he's a graduate. He's done a lot of youth work within his community. He's studied youth and community work um, with sports development at UEL. And he's been on the ground doing youth work since 2003. And in 2016, he became the founder and CEO of his own international and award-winning mentoring organization, Mentivity. His work has impacted the lives of, you know, many people in sports such as Reese Nelson, Adam Ola Lockman, and Jordan Ibe, just to name a few. And I want to hand over the screen to him. <laughs> I see you, Fix. <laughs> I want to hand over the screen to him so that he can make his presentation for about 10 minutes. Yeah, how's it going, everybody? Thank you, Victor. I really appreciate that, man. I don't even have to speak anymore. Like you just <laughs> said it all pretty much. But thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, even on a Friday night, I know it's difficult when people, you know, are here and giving up their time. So I really, really appreciate it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna play a video really quickly. Uh, and then I'll introduce myself a little more. All right, so let me just play this for you guys now. Just not the right one. Here we go. Safe Homes Lewis. He called on young people's opinions to be taken more seriously. I'm now joined by the founder and CEO of a mentoring organization, Mentivity. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to get you all in the room. I'm going to train you guys how to talk to young people. And so he did. SACE is now training new recruits to the Met Police in Southwark and Lambeth. And we were allowed to film part of the conversation. We talk about gang mentality. We've got gang mentality in certain areas, but then in terms of the police. We could also say that you guys are a gang in that respect. So I've been stopped and searched over 30 times in my life. I was assaulted by a police officer uh, at the age of 14, just going home from school on a train from Gypsy Hill. Um, and he asked me to get off the train and I asked him what was the reason. And then he assaulted me. Police um, officers that carry out this kind of overzealous style of policing need to be held accountable. Uh, and that's by the community first and foremost. If you're black in Britain today, you're more likely to be poor, to be the victims of crime and to be stopped by the police. Safe Holmes Lewis mentors and coaches young people. His own experiences of racism is why he is demanding action. In terms of obviously role modeling, this is why Mentivity was set up, is to provide mentoring support in formal education through conversation-based learning and also put progressive pathways into employment. We just launched a massive program with Goldman Sachs. So we're trying to do that in terms of trying to navigate young people away from that. But we've got to understand that some young people don't have the choice. When you're going to food banks, you're both your parents are working 40 hours weeks and you're at home being raised by YouTube and social media and you don't have what you need in life, you're going to go to the streets. So again, yes, it is a socioeconomic problem. But again, we look at middle class drug use as something that holds a slap on the wrist. But we, when we stop a young person with cannabis, they're criminalized almost instantly. So as a lawyer, you've got to look at it from that perspective that we need to look at this now as a structural issue. And as joined by community activist and youth advocate, Chase Holmes Lewis, who called on young people's opinions to be taken more seriously when tackling knife crime. I think that young people need to be consulted more often when it comes to implementing policy and in terms of, you know, voicing their opinions on how we can kind of counter this problem of, of serious youth violence. A multifaceted approach uh, and problem to, to the issue that young people are facing. When a head teacher or a school or organisation decides to exclude, permanently exclude an eight-year-old, you know, a young black male, like you are setting them up to fail. You are setting them up for the stereotypical journey of a young black man. So, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Um, I founded Mentivity in 2016. Um, I've been working, as Victor said, in the community since 2003. I've actually been coaching since the age of 16, so it's 21 years of coaching. Um, you mentioned some of the players as well. Jaden Sancho is one of the biggest kind of uh, talents that I've worked with. But my passion was football. Initially played professional football for two years in Ireland and Romania, uh, representing Barbados internationally as well. 
So I just really followed my passion, but I also needed the support of people in the community and people that look like me. And I wanted to replicate a service that provided support for young people within the school setting, which is, you know, very institutionally racist, but providing support and raising aspirations. And I just mentioned there, we've got a massive partnership now with Goldman Sachs, which is huge for us um, as part of the Racial Equity Fund. And in light of what happened to George Floyd, we were donated uh, £125,000 as a precursor to our long-term partnership on something called the Raising Aspirations Project, which is basically a targeted program to actually provide employment for young people and track their progress into um, organisations such as Goldman Sachs. So now we've been approached by YouTube, Google, so many other um, corporations that actually want us to help bring young people that look like ourselves um, into these organisations, but also train these staff to receive it. Um, and I'm just really passionate about what I do. And I've got one other little clip as well that I can show you. Um, I'm sure you guys know the Wall of Comedy. I'm doing a lot of work now with the Wall of Comedy. And they've just set up a YouTube football team, um, similar to the SC Dons. And as I said, I've been coaching now for 21 years. I've coached a lot of players. But now I'm running this team as well. So I'll just quickly show this clip as well. Get up. Give me one second. Just to say as well, just to say as well, congratulations on that funding. Congratulations wow. on that. Yeah, that's huge. That's literally yeah. huge for us because that helps us in terms of our capacity building. But now it's about upskilling the organization, but also now providing that support and actually getting these young people into these organizations because they don't see that they can do it. It's not viable, it's not visible for them. So that's, that's why it's important for us to do this now. So let me just show this. This is the wall of comedy. And it's a clip from our first episode that was released just this week. Formation! Press! 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 You know, this started from, uh, you know, Derek Wade doing the Polishing yeah. Project a long time ago. And we're here to continue his legacy. And, and that we will. Remember, I've got legacy on my arm. Uh, you know what time it is? Uh, from now on, we're family. If you don't be 100% in, you're not going to get in, you know what I'm saying? So if you're not putting in as much as you can, huh? there's going to be people that can always... You know, say. So, yeah, so everything's happening for me at the moment. Um, but it's been a lot of work, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of blood, sweat and tears. But I just wanted to raise the visibility for young people to see that they can progress. But it's important to find your passion and dedicate yourself to it, but persevere no matter what. So I'm just really in a period of kind of enlightenment for myself, but also just raising, you know, kind of issues that are happening in the community. Obviously the stop and search and now training the Met Police, which are now gonna train the whole of the Met Police for London. So all of the 12 borough commander units um, going cool. forward. So yeah, I'm just about change and about finding solutions and providing support for young people. No, for sure. And I've, it's good that you're doing it because one thing I wanna ask you about quickly before we move on to the next panelist is how, you know, you could even go back to how, you know, when the Windrush generation came here, there's always been an issue with, you know, the police and black communities. That's, that's, that's historical. It's not as well documented as it should be, but it's definitely been there. And if you speak to community leaders, it's been there the whole time. And it's good that you're in positions or people like you are in positions to actually coach the police, the one of the biggest organizations that we as a community generally have a problem with. Um, in order to uh, navigate that relationship, in order to heal that relationship as well. Because if nothing, if we don't enter those spaces then nothing really will change. I will ask you though, just one question. How do you think, obviously you're training the Met Police, but how do you think the police themselves, um, what's, what's one thing you would say to the police in order to better engage with black communities? And what would you say to black communities in order to better engage with the police at large? So it's a great question. I think my solution, which I've po obviously posed a question to the police now, is obviously the initial training around stop and search and cultural equity, but also conscious bias. I don't subscribe to unconscious bias. This is a conscious construct of the black community. Sure. And fueled by there many different facets within society, the media, just the perception of us, and people alluded to it earlier, that the black men as a beast and the, the, white, um, the women as a Jezebel. It's like, this yeah. is the way portrayed so the thing is now is actually getting rid of that kind of that, that narrative we need to take control of our own nar narrative also when I go there obviously I explain my journey from the Ellsbury estate in southeast London you know close to Peckham mm -hmm. and actually I'm having to overcome these obstacles just to live but by sharing that story and actually now 
is uh, kind of engaging them and asking them like, what is your perception of the black British community? Where does that come from? And a lot of these young people are from, they're, they're young officers and they come from rural parts of the UK. So their first experience of coming to London or seeing black people is on the TV. When I asked most of the officers, they just referred to boys in the hood. I'm like, that's South Central, that's not South East London. That's right. how many years ago. So why are you referring to that when you're talking about black people in the UK? So for me now, it's about increasing the, the footprint of black people within the police. And I'm not talking about bobbies on the beat. I'm talking about in forensics and cybercrime and all these different things, because then we have to actually infiltrate that environment. But also now getting the police to actually be embedded in the work that we're doing with the community. So they come in with us and we do projects and we run it with the police and basically this improved neighborhood policing. So it's a three strand, you know, three tiered approach to the problem. And I'm not going to solve it by myself, but this is a precursor to something potentially where we can actually start to build those bridges potentially. No, for sure, for sure, for sure. Deborah, over to you to introduce our next panelist. Yeah, I think I think what was mentioned honestly is is very important and I just hope that everyone was able to take something away from what was mentioned just now but personally I'm actually quite excited to introduce um, this next panelist her name is Larissa Kennedy. Um, Larissa Kennedy for some of you that do not know and need to hurry up and know um, is the NUS national president which is the national union of oh, national student national um, Anyway, either way, NUS, you get it. Um, <laughs> um, Larissa was formerly an education officer and deputy president at the Warwick Students' Union. And not only is she an advocacy and campaigns officer at the Plan International, she is a global gender equality charity. Um, in a volunteer capacity, Larissa is in a UK representative to the Global Secretary at the Youth for Change and was formerly a member of the British Youth Council's trustee board. Um, and not only just to wrap it up, she is the UK Youth Delegate to the Council of Europe Congress of Local and Regional Authorities. Can we give a round of applause for Larissa? I'm screaming a silent zoom uh, <laughs> round of applause, but round of applause. Virtual is... claps, everyone's screaming, I promise you. <laughs> everyone's legit <laughs> screaming in their bedrooms right now. Larissa, how are you feeling today? Good, good. Thank you so much for having me and for the introduction. No, um, thank you so much for coming, honestly. Um, I don't think I can share my screen right now. Like it's saying that it's um, host disabled attendee screen sharing. So I don't know. I think if you try now, it should work, hopefully. Let me have a look. Um, it's still saying it, but I can also just speak if that's easier. Because oh, this um, tech... I don't know. Oh, okay. You should, sorry. You should try now your co-host now. So hopefully that'll work. Yeah. Yay. Lovely. We love to see it. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to get into it. Um, and before we really uh, start to talk, I, I wanted to share a meme that I think is pertinent to the question of what the root cause of injustice is. Because whilst it's nice to pretend um, that oppression is just the result of ignorance, um, which many equality, diversity and inclusion initiatives do, like there's a reason why people in positions of power, um, you know, opt to attach themselves to and often willingly engage with um, you know, this kind of liberal work that promotes kind of um, empty education opportunities for those with power, because this work, it might solve some, some things in a minor way in, in the short term, but in the long term, it's not a threat to the privilege and power those people possess, nor is it a, th a threat to the systems and structures that uphold that power. Um, and in fact, you know, looking at this, I would go as far as saying um, that the assumption that if we erase ignorance or, you know, educate those um, who don't experience racism or any other form of oppression or injustice um, about that kind of form of oppression or injustice, that it won't exist, is just dangerous. Like, and I, I do think it's dangerous because this liberal lens, it sanitizes, it dilutes, it distracts from, it guts the teeth from the truly emancipatory work and like, in plowing resources and energy um, into that, it actually actively avoids the disruption of the status quo and consequently reifies the dominant power structures that we're seeking um, to dismantle. So, you know, I think the, the assumption that ignorance is the root cause and that the kind of liberal ideal that we can educate our way out of oppression um, it ha it has actually resulted in some of the reformist ideologies that we see um, impacting black communities now. Like it saddled us 
globally with the prison industrial complex um, and by extension police brutality which black folks are railing against of course we're just hearing that here but also in the US in Nigeria right now and um, that's really flaring up like these are things that we are trying to actually uproot as a global black community. So I think to even begin to do radical work, we have to recognize that injustice and oppression, it's not about ignorance, it's about power. Um, and I know there's some weird connotations with the word radical. And when I say liberal versus radical, I just want to quantify and qualify what I mean by that. Um, and I, you know, I always, me, I'm quoting Angela Davis every single day. Um, but Sis said, Auntie, let me put some respect on her name. Auntie Angela said to us, radical simply means grasping things at the root. And, you know, so often it's easy to get trapped in the weeds of, of injustice. And by that, I mean, you know, the symptoms of things that are springing up around us quicker than we can even cut them down. One minute we're facing, you know, as Ren was saying, the slurs and the, and the um, uncomfortable things people are saying um, in, uh, you know, spaces of power. The next, um, it's police brutality. The next, um, it's erasure from the curriculum. The next, you know, it's all of these things that are hitting us on like multiple interconnected fronts. So how do we actually grasp at the root of that instead of expending all of this energy tackling each and every weed springing up around us um and obviously like i'm i'm, I'm president of the national union of students so i have to use universities and, and that framework as a kind of um case study for this argument because when when i say like what is what is that root when, when i'm talking about grasping at the root i think we need to recognize that the academy has historically been an intentional site of racial violence. You know, Afra mentioned um, the need to decolonize science. And I think it's important to recognize that UK universities were one of the first exports of what was deemed scientific racism through eugenics. Like this was not ignorance. This was a purposeful effort to categorize people with blackness actively posited in proximity to death. Our education system and the universities that we're navigating now are built on historical genocide, enslavement, displacement and colonialism and people of colour still have not received any form of reparation to acknowledge the intergenerational trauma that they're complicit in um, but also the, the ways that that maps into our living reality as students today as black students specifically like in our personal interactions you know people have sp spoken about those experiences already on the call um, but also the, the erasure and invisibilization from the curriculum but also the kind of how it impacts our access to safe employment, to, to safe healthcare, to safe housing, to immigration rights, and all of these other things um, that white supremacy is impacting and, and the ways that we experience that um, as black students. Um, and yeah, I just, I think we've got to get into that, that institutional structural level of like, what are we actually trying to achieve uh, when we say we want to um, tackle injustice, when we say we want to tackle oppression? Like, I, I can't really speak for um, the prejudice side of things because I think um, that is quite a, that, that, is, that term is used quite interchangeably, but, but often speaks to quite less structural um, things with less structural implications. Um, but particularly for injustice, um, that's what I'm kind of focusing on. And to take one example that really speaks to this fix, you mentioned um, the black attainment gap. Um, and you know, up and down the country, like over the past few years, I've seen people continually trying to address ignorance around this by, you know, informing people about the black attainment gap. And these university senior managers, without fail, every single time, they're like, shock, what? Never me, never my university, I can't believe it. Let's do everything that we can, oh my goodness. No, no, black attainment gap, where? Show me, please, where's the data? Um, and, you know, they, they pump hours of time and buckets of money into closing the black attainment gap, but really what they do is they give surface level responses, they educate themselves and the rest of the senior management team and they all sit around their ivory tower talking about it. Um, and, and black students find themselves in very much the same position they've always been um, years and years later. It is so exhausting and that's why um, I think this is really, it's not about ignorance, it's about power and redressing power. And in, this, in the sense of universities, that's about decolonizing not only the curriculum, but the university more widely. Um, and, and the way that I would begin to describe that is around actively striving to radically reimagine the systems and structures of our universities through an anti-racist and anti-oppressive lens. Um, but I know people want to get into questions, so I'm going to kind of leave it there. Um, but really, um, the, the kind of crux of my argument is, is that we don't uproot racism by removing ignorance. We uproot racism by building the communities amongst ourselves as black people 
that center our collective liberation. Now, if you have not learned something from what Larissa just preached, can we talk it, can we call it a preaching? Like from what Larissa really just spoke about, I honestly think you were not opening your ears, period. Um, I were taking notes. I just, I say that because I'm a politics student and honestly we're learning about it now. So it's helping my degree, do you get? So, um, but yeah, like you spoke about decolonizing the curriculum and I think um, one point that I'd like to bring up or just a question actually to yourself since you are um, the NUS president is that do you think that um, decolonizing the curriculum or the way how the universities are taking an approach to decolonizing the curriculum is really just a cop out as um, in a way um, to just say we've ticked a box, if that makes sense. Oh, definitely. Like, I, I would say that universities are attempting to co-opt and dilute the movement to decolonize. Yeah. Um, because, of course, decolonization is is always going to be counter to their their aims and to their objectives. Like I saw a tweet the other day that said the only way university organizing will ever truly enact meaningful and permanent change is the day we abolish universities as we know them. Because, it, OK, for example, like having even even the way that we, we get taught, like if you look at the idea that universities um, are structured around one person holding knowledge and being the person who can um, literally legitimize and delegitimize knowledge by virtue of having been in the field for a long time. Um, but we're just supposed to be like, as, as students, we're supposed to be recipients of that knowledge and just accept that this one person is the arbiter of what is and isn't knowledge. That's never going to be fully fundamentally anti-racist. Like that's it's just like even pedagogically, universities are set up in a way um, that is so like individualized and, and problematic. Um, and if you look at universities in in the literally, if you go back to like, when universities started, um, people were arguing over which model of university should be used. Should it be students seeking knowledge, deciding how to um, decide what is and isn't things they want to be taught, or should it be one person? deciding what is the good knowledge that everyone needs to learn and sit back and listen um, and of course they wanted to uphold their power so they said oh we're gonna we're gonna decide we know what knowledge is and we're gonna tell you what what you need to learn um, and that's it, you can see it back from those hundreds and hundreds of years they had this lens through which they saw um, the the positioning of uh, students as um, passive as listener um, and, and that's just never going to be anti-racist because we we share as black folks like if you look at the way we share knowledge particularly in in the most creative and artistic of ways in very collective ways um, like I think if we could inject that into an education system that would be really really powerful. I think that makes total sense I think even the point of us as a community the way how we express ourselves I heard one person actually say that um, technically back black culture is culture you know like the way how we really um express ourselves as a community across the diasporas is is so vast that it, there's no way that we couldn't you know take such points um but my final question to you um larissa is kind of tell me a bit about your role as um an nus president and what impact has nus really had on the black community I mean, the role is is wild. Like, it's particularly the past few months when everything that's been happening to students. Um, I would say, like, so one of the key parts of the role is really building um, transformative campaigns that seek to to really reimagine the reality students are navigating right now. Um, so it involves a lot of meeting with um, ministers um, about you know the decisions and the policies that they're um, using to literally control students right now in a really harmful way um, so particularly stuff around the return to campus um, we continue to lobby um, universities to make sure things are actually safe for students because there's so much um, that just hasn't been safe for students so you know I've heard from a lot of people who've been questioning like why were people sent back to university with no plan um, in the middle of a global pandemic um, and there's just no like it's literally collecting tuition fees, correct, collecting rent from students with no plan for how to keep them safe. And it's been absolutely ridiculous. So a lot of my work has been focused around that. And if you want to check that out, us as students deserve a campaign and I'll drop a link um, to our petition and stuff that we're doing in the chat. Um, little plug. Um, but yeah, and in terms of how NUS is related specifically um, to black students, that there is like a black students campaigners network. So, um, which was historically known as the black students campaign. And like, um, 
NUS has always done like quite transformative like black led organizing um like literally for for decades um and it's just honestly building on that legacy um and right now we've we've started the kind of national decolonized campaign uh, for the first time and like it's literally been built up for for years like black students have been pouring into this and um and like to be able to now see like a national um, decolonized campaign and be supporting um, local chapters of the campaign. And now that I've heard um, that there's one at York, I'm going to be in touch with you folks um, um, to connect you with um, everyone else that's doing that around the country because it's collectively that we're able to, to share knowledge and share power and, um, and all the things that we're learning from the local context um, to build a stronger movement. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear that and yeah, I'll be in touch. No, we're just as excited to hear about it as well. Um, so before we move on, can we just give everyone say thank you on the chat? If you are listening for all my people that are there, let's say a thank you to Larissa and then up to you, Victor. Sweet, sweet, sweet. No, in the chat, in the chat. Um, before we get into the last panellist, um, these panellists are here to answer your questions. They're here to present ideas, um, but they're also here to answer your questions. So if you have any questions for any of the panelists we're going to go to our last panelist now but if you have any questions for them be sure to put it in the q a section or be sure to raise your hand at the end when we come to you we come to what you want to know from their experiences their knowledge or their positions of expertise on certain subjects so we're going to go to the final panelist now and you could argue the most esteemed person in the room um he joined the University of York as the academic registrar in 2019. But I would say that, especially if you look at his history, he's so much more than just the academic registrar at the University of York. That there's so much more to him. He's also a biochemistry graduate from the University of Kent, which I have personal ties to, so big up Kent. And that's where he also gained a PhD in the field of biotechnology, which has become increasingly important in our time. He's also the holder of two masters from Cambridge and Loughborough, respectively. Now, after working as a senior research associate at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, University of London, he decided to make his transition into higher educational administration, basically. And I'd like to know a little bit why, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, he sat as the chair of the OIA Higher Education Advisory Panel from 2013 to 2016. And he's also served as the academic registrar at the University of Essex and the University of Lincoln, and as the director of student services and senior master at the University of Kent. Little paying homage there, I respect that. Now his experience, you know, as you can probably imagine, extends to all aspects of the student journey from just admission to graduation and beyond, obviously including higher education administration and enhancing the quality of teaching, learning, student life, and you could argue most importantly, employability at the end of it all. Dr. Wayne Campbell, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us. I see that, I see that. I think you've been taking notes the entire time. Is that correct? I haven't been taking notes. I was just interested in things that people were saying. So I just jotted a few things down. That's cool. Okay. Okay. But now, nah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, I appreciate that your schedule is probably very busy, especially at this time that we're in now. So we appreciate you for joining us. Over to you. Great. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate in in this event and uh, thanks to Benny, Larissa and I hope I pronounced this right, Say, 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 or uh, forgive me, Holmes Lewis. <laughs> yeah, bless you. Um, for, for, for the very thought-provoking things that you've done and actually listening, I think very inspirational as well. And I think it's, it's important to be inspirational for the young and up-and-coming black people in this country. Um, for me, personally, my family came from rural Jamaica, and that's been mentioned once or twice in this, to the UK in, in the late 1950s as part of the Windrush generation. So they were the uh, people that came over after the war. Today, they would be classified as economic migrants. Back then, they were invited over by the British government. Uh, and my mother had an expectation that she imposed on her children that we could only improve our lot by education. And education was seen as being the key for us 
at unlocking success. And we were offered free education as it was then, and we should take advantage of it. My mother in true Caribbean style and African mothers are the same, expect their children to go to university and take great pride in it. Not all do actually, to be honest, but a number of us take great pride in we go. I remember when I went, there was great pride in my family. And I've met a number of students since where they, they talked about the pride in their families when they went to university. I came from a big town and, and craved a small campus environment. And for me, I was fortunate enough to be offered a, a place at the University of Kent. You know about my, my first degree and my, uh, and my subsequent PhD and my other degrees as well. But the thing I'd like to share with you is that when I was growing up uh, as, a, as a young man in the 70s and, and the 80s, uh, there were no real role models for me apart from people that competed in athletics, the likes of your Daley Thompson, Linford Christie, Colin Jackson, Tessa Sanderson, and music, you know, Lionel Blair, sorry, Lionel Richie. <laughs> way back, yeah. That's way back, yes. James Brown, Errol Brown from Hot Chocolate. You know, I never, you know, in many senses, quite stereotypical roles. There were no role models in, in, in academia for me to, to latch on to. And I knew nothing then of, a, of Samuel Coleridge Taylor, uh, an English composer and conductor. That's music. A person that was lauded and supported by Edward Elgar and greeted at the White House by President Theodore Teddy Roosevelt in 1904. A number of us actually remember Edward Elgar. But actually, at his peak, Samuel Coleridge Taylor was as famous as Elgar. But who remembers Coleridge Taylor? Not many. And for me, I was totally unaware of people like uh, Margaret Busby. Do you know she was Britain's youngest first black female book publisher? And Mary Jackson, who became the first African-American female engineer to work at NASA. I never knew about John Archer, a British politician and political activist who became mayor of Battersea, becoming the first black mayor in London. And even Alan Glazer Minns, a, a Bahamian doctor who was elected to, in Tetford as uh, Norfolk uh, in, I think, in 1904. And he was the first black mayor in Britain. And I never knew about Len Johnson, the boxer, who won 93 fights, but never, ever became British champion. But yet he defeated the reigning British champion twice. And someone else that, be, that went on to become what um, Lennox, not Lennox Lewis, but... Um, uh, Mike Tyson described as the, the best boxer ever to come out of Britain. And he was denied the right to fight for the British title because he was black. And I never knew about Garrett Morgan, an African-American inventor, businessman and community leader in 1923, who invented the three-way the three-way traffic light system that we have today. Yeah. You know, and I never knew about people like uh, Mary Van Britton Brown, an American inventor, the first of the closed circuit TV. She invented it to protect her home, basically, to stop people breaking in so she could see who was coming to the door, so she could either send a siren to sound off to the police or indeed uh, let them in. You know, I, I never knew about these people. I, I didn't really have any role models. Um, I never had the advantage of seeing black people succeed in academia as writers, as scientists and successful people. But I had one hell of a pushy mother and she believed in me and instilled a commitment for work, hard work and values, never giving up. And I have to say, for me, she was my role model. And I, I had to find my own path. And, you know, in finding that path, I became the first black academic registrar of a British, of a UK university. And for me, being here at York is a, is a great privilege. You, you pointed out my responsibilities. It, it covers a lot of the student related matters from when you start here to when you leave and graduate and student life and well-being you mentioned careers online partnerships even the academic courses that you study uh, are overseen by by my staff and also the library and the archives come under me as well and the, the vice chancellor recently invited me to join the university's executive board uh, which comprises of 14 people and two of us are BAME, 
myself and the PVC for partnership and, and engagement. And I have to say, from my perspective or point of view, it's probably the most diverse executive board that I've encountered during my time in higher education. You know, if you were to say to me, Wayne, did you encounter prejudice as you were growing up? The answer is yes, I did. Have I encountered one as a senior manager? Well, none that I'm aware of, but if you're a senior manager, it's very difficult for people that maybe hold that point of view to express it to you directly. I have encountered it in a, a, a noted Russell Group University. Uh, and, and also, um, at one point, I, I got fairly sick of people wheeling me out on every occasion when there was an EDI audit or visit, when they wanted a black point of view, and I was the only one there that could give it. Um, I got tired of that. But I, I don't experience that at, at York. For me, actually, uh, one of the greatest moments in my career was when I was at the University of Kent, my last institution, to see the first black student become president of the Students' Union. And I'm really pleased uh, to see that I have before me one here that is president uh, of the National Union of Students. Mm. Yeah, and at yeah. NUS level, we do see see many more. But for me, at Kent, it was an actual breakthrough in what was predominantly a white university. And that was followed up by another black student who became the first female black president at the University of Kent. For me, actually, it was a Barack Obama type moment. Yeah. And in terms of what I'd like to say f f to, to, the, to the students out there, for, for me, actually, I, I, my, my wisdom, for what it's worth, is um, get a plan. Why can't you be a successful business person or professional? Why can't you achieve? And I think you should be thinking about that now. I've met too many young people that sit back in some cases and think it's going to come. I've met a number of black people that are quite out there and want it and strive for it. But there are, there are some that sit back and think that life is going to present it to them on a plate. And I know that things are difficult now, but I would say that the things that university has to offer, you should take advantage of. For example, we've got a York Strengths program, online program run by careers that's available, helping you identify the strengths that you need to improve your employability. I would say to, to, to every black student, take advantage of it. It's free. And my view is, don't, don't just get a plan, but get active, get involved. You know, you don't change anything from the outside. The only way that you and I can change society and the way that our universities run and also the way that our club societies are led is for you to be part of it. So you need to take positions of leadership in all of those, at all of those levels. And my question to you is why can't we have a black SUS president at York? Why not have a black SU president at York? We did it to Kent. But I think that in terms of what we, what you look to achieve, there has to be a degree of realism uh, that, that, that needs to go with it. And also the, the view that I have, you have to be prepared to fail, but never give up. And what I would say to you is I think the challenge for you, I believe, uh, as the younger, uh, certainly the generation coming through, is to establish yourself as a positive role model for others to follow. And I think that's quite important. Um, when you see some of the role models that are there, I think actually they don't present a good example for, for, for the young coming up. But you guys, you guys have, have that power. We talked about power. It's, you know, that power is in your hands. And I'm hoping that I can see you. you know, I'd, like to see, I'd like to see you as perhaps at some point the first black prime minister or I'd like to see many more CEOs of, of companies that come from a BAME background. That would give me great pleasure in my dotage. Uh, and for me, uh, you know, I chair uh, a number of university groups and committees. You talked about the black attainment gap and you said it's just, well, I, th I think it's Larissa said it's just like a number that's to be ticked. It, it isn't to me, actually. It's, uh, it, it's something that I would want to see happen uh, in terms of, in my life, I mean, I got a note from a colleague from from uh, the University of York, who's a, 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 a black female colleague working in their department of law, 
And, you know, she said when she started, was it two to three years ago, the black attainment gap in law at, at Kent was, it was in double figures. Mm. But this year, for the first time, it was plus 1% in law. Mm. Uh, and that was due to her commitment and her hard work with academic members of staff. So I do think it's not just a tick box exercise. I think actually it's possible if we're committed to it. And in terms of the university, um, you know, EDI is a, a thread that runs through the entirety of our new strategy for 20, 2020, 2030. And I'll leave it there. I uh, just to answer any questions. No, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for just that's that's really inspirational actually what you said really inspirational i think that you're right i think that isn't in our owners to you know make a plan and really succeed or aim to succeed in the same levels that everybody else in society is succeeding you know even though you know there's a saying that you have to work twice as hard and you know there's there are obstacles along the way and most of us in this room will probably be aware of those obstacles i do think that it's really important that despite those and we've been seeing that we've been seeing that time and time again and even that statistic you shared you know proves that despite those obstacles we've still been succeeding regardless we've still been showing our excellence and being able to celebrate ourselves regardless so no thank you for that i really appreciate that i do want to ask you this though couple questions for sure i want all let me just say this as well to the audience. If you want to ask any of the panelists any questions, this is your opportunity to do that. They're here for you. But Dr. Campbell, I want to ask, what actually motivated you to get into, you know, higher education administration just on a general basis? Because you were doing research initially, initially and you were working body in science. So what made you make that transition? I'll give you the honest answer. I really couldn't stand being a bench scientist working at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, which is now part of Imperial College. Sure. And um, I, was, I was in the library one day reading an article on the MAC initiative, which is the Management Administrative Computing Initiative. And I thought, this is interesting. And I read a bit more and I thought, hey, I'd like to be involved in this. That's a good career choice. What do I need to be able to succeed? Oh, I need a master's in IT. So I went to Loughborough. The government sponsored me. I got uh, I got a scholarship uh, and with a bursary, and did a, a master's in IT, and then applied for a job. And I was fortunate enough to be offered a, a position. Somebody took a chance on me. They liked me at interview, and they took a chance on me. I was quite passionate. I'm very passionate about what I do, and that's how I got into the higher education administration. Um, as a, I, got, I was fortunate enough to come in as a middle manager, and then rose up the ladder, applying for various jobs and this university is my seventh university yeah in he no that's great that's great now I want to open it up to all of the panelists so all the questions from here on out anyone can answer anyone can jump in and um, i want to ask first of all you know obviously it's black history month and you know we're here we're celebrating we're learning as well what would you say that black history month means to you and where do you think it should go in the future that's my question. Anyone can jump in. I'll, I'll, um, I think personally that we need to move away from it just being one month. And I think it's very tokenistic in that essence. And I think like what we're saying, trying to decolonize the curriculum, but also give the foundation for our young people to understand and with more recent history. You know, my grandparents came here in the Windrush generation too and learning about their interactions with people when they came here and the struggles is still the same things that we're, we're, we're facing today in different guises. And I think for us, we need to make sure that, as someone alluded to earlier, that we need to, education is embedded in the home, that's where it should start. And that's where you need to learn those first experiences and, and shape your worldview, especially of the, of the African diaspora and all of the hidden history. And I think it's so important that we now take the, the, the mantle up and say, look, we're going to do this in our spare time. We're going to get these children together and educate them because this system of institutional racism, it, it just protrudes every you know, part of society and especially education. And my son's 14 and he's still studying the same books I did you know, 21 years ago. 
the inspector calls Macbeth like we've got to decolonize this education but we also got to do it in the home and we've got to do it in in kind of more innovative ways for young people because the attention span now with the advent of social media is a problem so we have to incorporate technology in that so it's very very important and as an informal educator myself it's important that we learn through conversation learn through sharing experiences learn through doing so I just think for us we need to take control of Black History Month and say look this is not Let's make it Black History Year. Let's make 2021 Black History Year. You know, and let's just be more groundbreaking in that respect. I that. No, I heard that for sure. For sure. Anyone else want to jump in or? I know the yeah, I fundamentally agree. Like, I think we need to see Black History Month as, as a kind of plaster over a wound. And when we're doing the work of decolonization, we're actually treating the wound as opposed to just keep sticking plasters over the set. Do you know what I mean? Like we can't keep going around and around and around being like, okay, we're going to just fit it into a month. And that's going to be enough. Like who eats enough in a month to the last of the whole year? Like that's not sustenance, um, particularly for us as black folks. Like um, for me, like it, even if we remove others from the, from the equation, which I think is equally important for them to be learning about it, but um, f for us and, and for us to be focusing and, and, and getting access to the knowledge that we need to and like all of those things, like that should, we should have that access. We should have that in a day to day. It shouldn't just be um, a focus for the month. So absolutely agree um, with what they said and think um, that, that the work that you know, even your, your officers and, and the people that are representing here are doing already at York um, is going to go away to, to support in that. No, for sure. For sure. Obviously, fix Simi, the work, the work that those who have put in and what they've endured over the year. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that we have to commend them for, for sure. Okay. To be able to even put this together and like, to be able to, to deal with the, <laughs> some of the challenges they faced early in the year, for sure. They know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> we've got a question for Dr. Campbell. Um, it says, this is from Yola as well. Hey, Yola. Um, how do we find black mentors and how do we reach out to them? In fact, before you answer that, yeah, I just want to say this, yeah, I think that as black people, it's very important that we do have black mentors as well, because it's, as someone who knows, I'm not mentored per se myself, but as someone who knows plenty of people that are, they always tell me that when they have a black mentor who kind of understands the, the hidden minutia, the unsaid things that they go through, they're able to guide them through that with more precision so i'd say it's important for black people to have at least one black mentor dr campbell how could we actually get those black mentors for ourselves it's a, it's a good question actually um i have mentored uh, young people in the past certainly maybe two or three maybe four at kent directly um and i think it's about being able to to find people that you can relate to um, in any walk of life and uh, you know successful business people and perhaps why don't it's a challenge actually uh, this is a good challenge for you why don't we why don't you go to your career service um, don't call it my career service it's your career service it's mm -hmm. for the University of York uh, and ask them well you know I'd, I'd like a mentor uh, because we, we do offer a, we do offer a mentor mentoring type service there and say you know I'd, I'd like a black mentor and I'd like to know what the answer that you get is actually that, that would be quite informative yeah that'd me. be interested actually yeah yeah so um but, but you know I'm I'm open to mentoring um you know I've done it in the past and I, and I think actually it I think all successful people can act as mentors I see I see Holmes Lewis there um you know he's done a great job he, you know a, a mentor a mentor already uh, and Larissa, I think again, Benny. I think these the people that you've invited onto this panel show. I think are people that can fulfil that more than fulfil that role. And my view is that whilst you have them here, you should ask them. <laughs> ah, I hear that. I hear that loud. And I'm pretty sure that being the calibre of people they are, they will they will agree. Uh, and you, you know. Um, you know, try the career service. I'm not, I won't say anything, and they probably won't see this this webinar. But, you know, I'd, I'd like to know what answer you get, actually, if you ask that question of our career service. That'd be interesting. I might, I don't know, if I do, I'll run it by you. Say, so let me even bring you in on this question as well. Yeah. Would you, obviously, you've worked with, you've been a mentor for how long? And you've worked with some very, you know, esteemed athletes, you know, in RS, T-O-I-G, in it. But, um, <laughs> 
But what would you say is the impact of mentorship and how can we go about getting a mentor? Because it seems like a very lofty thing for some people. When you're talking to someone that's the founder and CEO of a mentoring organization, so mentoring, yeah. mentoring organization, and that's what we've been doing. And I've been doing it in the community for, as I said, 21 years. And it's been mentoring in different set settings. It's not just the sporting context, obviously, within education, um, to the point where we're actually mentoring and training teachers, you know, newly qualified teachers. So my brother, Tyson, and Leon, they're both my business partners. Mentoring is embedded in, in society. It's something that happens informally. It happens every day. And I think when we go back to the family structure, especially the African and Caribbean households, you had those mentors in that system where mm -hmm. you had the hierarchy of the grandparents, the parents, and then the children. And that was a, it was intergenerational mentoring. So that's what we're really focusing on um, with mentivity is that intergenerational intergenerational dialogue and mentoring. Because now we've got a, a a pool of young people that are essentially lost because they don't have any history, historical context of who they are, no foundation, no culture. And all they look to is the youth culture, which is out there. And we always do that. You know, you go back to the teddy boys, you go back to historically, we always have people that are, you know, conform to some sort of music or culture. But I think for us now, mentoring needs to be professionalized. And the fact that you guys are asking about black mentors, I'm happy to, to give them my time and mentor anybody if they're willing to engage in, in collaboration. And it's about guided discovery because what Dr. Campbell said, it resonated with me from start to finish. From my grandparents coming here in the wind rush and to just actually not having mentors when I was young and not having people that looked like me within education, only in music and certain other realms. So you look to those people, but the thing is now is that actually getting people to mentor collectively. And that's what we're trying to champion within the community that giving your time to young people that are not within your family or not your children, that equals love because you're not obligated to give that time to young people. So young people see that as love. So when you're giving your time to someone, they're like, he doesn't have to be here. He's got his own problems. He's got his own issues, but he's coming here for me. Now I can see that that's love. And I've mentored people from the age of, you know, seven, eight up to, you know, 28. And they've, I'm still their mentor to this year, to this, to, to this day. And it's important that it's, it's lifelong mentoring, it's lifelong support. So if you guys want to look at that and explore it as a university, I'm definitely down to have the conversation and figure out how we can do that because we've got Zoom, so it's easy enough. Yeah, for sure. And for sure as well, we'll leave the contact details of if everyone's all right with that, we'll be able to circulate all the contact details so everyone will be able to get in contact with the speakers from today um, in case you know they actually want to build that relationship. I'm conscious of time, so I just want to ask one final question. If you know we're all university students in here, what's one thing that you would want to leave us with, you know, <laughs> 2020 is 2020 thus you could say and it's also been a you know a painful but also a historical year in the Black Lives Matter movement and um, so what would you say to us going forward into 2021 and beyond as we start off careers? I'd say remember you can make a difference you know for me you're the future and you shouldn't let the events of the present change your path for the future you know you need to look forward and ahead not back forward and ahead and build and learn from the past that's what i'd like to leave you with for sure for sure safe any last words yeah i, I echo the sentiments but for me personally what <laughs> kind of helped me in my life is find your passion dedicate yourself to it and persevere no matter what because your passion will ultimately change in life. But if you follow your passion, you're not going to need to be motivated by extrinsic sources. That's going to come from within. You know, when it's 5 a.m., you've got to get up and do something in relation to your passion. That passion is going to get you through. And that's what's led me to what I'm doing today. So with all young people, I always tell them, find your passion, dedicate yourself to it, persevere no matter what. No, for sure, man, for sure. No. Nah. Oh, Dr. Campbell, say Holmes Lewis, we appreciate you, appreciate your time, and we appreciate your insight. It's been really insightful and inspirational. Um, I do want to hand over back to the BAME officers now. They're going to share the results of the poll and round us up. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so we've got the poll results on the screen. The attendees, everyone's been able to see it. So that's actually quite close. That's actually quite close. Yeah, that's I think, that re I think that reflects what was discussed as well, because it was, we were, there was a lot of overlap on what we were saying. Um, but yeah.
Yes, yes, yes. Afro, I guess you could say that you edged it out. Congratulations. Well done. Yeah, well done. I would say there's a prize, but I'd be lying. You get the, the prize. prize is celebration. Yeah, Thank the you. prize is celebration. The prize is prize. You feel me? <laughs> <laughs> the prize is prize. Now, well done, well done. Both of you, though, both of you, you argued your points with conviction and very well. You structured them very well. And um, Nasa, congratulations, Afra. Um, Ren, also, you do my degree. You need to message me. I need to tell you something. <laughs> Just bef- no, do you know what? Before I forget in it, so yeah, shout me in it. Okay, right, um, thanks. Let me hand over to the BAME officers now. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I just want to um, thank you again for coming. And if you want to sign up to our mailing list, our um, email is bme at usu.org. And our Twitter and Instagram are usu underscore bme. And our Facebook is usu BAME. Thank you guys for all coming and just for like the very thought provoking conversations and just in general for staying and asking questions as well as the debaters. So thank you guys. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists for showing up for your amazing talks, your videos and just for everything in general. And I would share all your social media and if you would like to contact the panelists, please let us know and we would send you their details. And have a good rest of the week. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Thanks Debs and Victor, for hosting um, today. Great. 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 So, I just, just want to say, say it's, it's been an absolute pleasure too, listening sir. to your story and, and meeting you. Absolute pleasure. Definitely connect. Yeah. And thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Can you pass me Sace's details by some task? Can you email them to me? Yes, Is that possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. See, the connect, see the connection? Do you? Yeah. We love to I mean, see it. I mean. <laughs> love to see it. So you're never too old to learn. That's, that's the important thing. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.